So we've talked about gross effects. That is um, effects that are easily, uh, easily observable and which are clearly not uh, features on the ground. You can tell that there's some kind of error going on. Um, but there are more subtle effects, effects related to the atmosphere and related to topography that also influence raw images. And so uh, very often we want to correct for those. So it's easy to accept uh, that what you're looking at is sort of a direct copy of reality in which the digital numbers directly represent features on the ground. But you have these variations in scene illumination, um, viewing geometry, so the direction in which um, the surface is relative to the sensor, as well as um, atmospheric conditions. And each of these are going to vary depending on the specific sensor and platform used to acquire the data and the conditions during data acquisition. So specifically or, or the atmosphere. Also, it may be desirable to convert or calibrate the data to known absolute units, either um, radiance, you know, brightness or reflectance percent of uh, illumination being returned in order to facilitate comparison between data. So you could see that an image taken in um, summer versus an image taken in winter, even if the conditions on the ground are similar, um, you're going to have different patterns of illumination, right? You're going to have more illumination during the summer and you might want to do some calibration um, either to an absolute reference uh, of reflectance or um, to, to somehow re more directly relate the brightness is found on one image to the other image. So what's a digital number? So a digital number is the um, value that we find within pixels and you've done uh, look up on those pixels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a digital number is a function of the reflectance of the target material, right? So we've looked at spectral reflectance curves. Um, you know, we can see the percent of energy that's going to be returned from the surface. That fundamentally is what we're interested in. Um, but there are these other effects. So for instance, solar distance varies throughout the year. And so that will give you slight differences in illumination that you're not interested in. Um, atmospheric scattering and absorption. So we know that uh, we're gonna have different amounts of scattering in the different wavelengths under different atmospheric conditions. And so um, they're going to give us variability that again, I mean, unless we're studying the atmosphere, um, we're not interested in for land surface remote sensing. Uh, the slope and the aspect of reflecting surfaces relative to the solar azimuth. So that is, um, you know, we've spoken before, you have um, north versus south facing slopes, South facing slopes are brighter than north facing slopes. And so um, it's important to take out those effects because you might be looking at the same thing, but it would appear different depending on whether it was on a north facing or south facing slope. Um, the angle of view of the sensor, so where it's pointing relative to local terrain orientation, and then there are settings within the sensor itself that um, relate brightnesses to the digital number that's recorded. So um, that also goes into what a digital number actually is. The primary atmospheric uh, effect that we need to correct for is the addition of light from um, path radiance and path radiance is the light that originates from scattering processes. Uh, it's scattered through the atmosphere multiple times and then back to the sensor. Okay, and it adds to literally, you know, it's an addition process um, to the total radiance being observed at the sensor. So if you look at the 
the, the sun in the upper left. Um, the red line represents light that is directly illuminating the pixel of interest there, which is on the right at the bottom. Okay, and then that light is being scattered. Um, I'm sorry, um, that light is being uh, reflected uh, up uh, in the direction again of that red arrow and toward the uh, sensor itself. So that's the sort of obvious thing you think when you look at an image, light being reflected off some object being recorded in the sensor. But there are other processes going on. And so if we look at the yellow lines, okay, this is again, you know, solar radiance. Um, and then where all the lines meet, you get some scattering, okay? Now, some of that scattered light is, is directed toward the surface. Some of it's gonna um, hit uh, the pixel of interest there on the right. There's also some of that light that's going to um, be um, reflected off of the uh, adjacent pixel. So adjacent pixel um, uh, reflectance also shows up for individual pixels. Um, um, so yellow light, again, it's gonna be illuminating surfaces, um, yellow light, sorry, scattered light. Some of the light's gonna be re-scattered. Okay, so that's that line that goes to the upper right. Okay, so it might be rescattered into uh, the direction of the sensor, just in a random process. So our path radiance is going to be the radiance of um, of light that is not um, being reflected directly from the pixel of interest. It's going to be all the additional light that occurs because of these other processes. And so those are all added together and then conceptually, and then that purple arrow is the path radiance. You add the path radiance and the direct radiance, and that gives you the total radiance of the sensor. And so what you'd like to do is get rid of that, um, that path radiance. And again, the reason is that you'd like to be able to compare images. And um, if you have one image that um, where there is, for instance, um, higher humidity, or maybe there's smoke, uh, you know, aerosol uh, particles, um, let's say that are, are diffuse in a way that they're not completely blocking the image, but they are giving you biases in various bands, well then, if you want to compare that to a clear sky image, you're going to need to take out the atmospheric effects to make them directly comparable. So uh, another way to look at all this is the, the haze, right? And the, the other atmospheric effects you see on the ground, uh, and we've seen a lot of them this fall with the smoke, uh, is also seen by sensors. So they change the digital numbers. And as you can see here, um, you're looking at sort of three forested areas at different uh, distances. And, you know, at the, the longer distances, you're seeing through a longer column of air. And so as a consequence, you are, uh, you're seeing more of it. So you can really see in some places, for instance, the Smoky Mountains of the American Southeast, um, um, uh, you can get these very um, uh, smoky images and it's not actually smoke, it's like terpenes that are given off by the trees themselves. But um, this is going to change perhaps dramatically what you're observing with a, a sensor because remember here we're just looking, uh, I don't know, a few tens of kilometers, whereas from space we're looking through maybe 400 kilometers of atmosphere, so the effects can get quite significant. Okay, so that's one thing that has to be done, atmospheric correction. We have another, which is topographic correction, right? So topographic slope and aspect, we know, introduce further radiometric distortion. 
So um, you have this local variation in view and illumination angles. And so identical surface objects might be represented by totally different intensity values. And it's difficult to remove. It's become easier because now we have um, access to really high um, quality topographic information from things like LIDAR, and which we'll discuss later, and from interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar. And so it's, it's become somewhat easier. There are also, we'll see digital processing approaches that allow us to take this out. And um, here we see uh, a very mountainous landscape and we have um, very dark areas that you can see are um, related to the topography and not to the, the surface. So we'd like to remove that if we can. So we've talked about radiometric correction, changing the values. Now we're gonna talk about geometric correction. And all remote sensing images at, out of the can, so to speak, you know, when, you, when you're looking at just the raw images, we know they're gonna show displacement in either a radial, um, that's with a photo type sensor, or linear, a scanning type sensor fashion. Um, satellite images are also not taken along a north-south axis, but some degrees off because um, you know, you've got some declination um, on your, you know, most commonly used um, um, near polar orbit satellites. So in one way or another, they're going to be distorted in their geometry. You're not going to be able to just take them and, you know, open them up into a GIS and, um, and have them overlay. So in order to get them to represent, you know, geographic coordinates, they have to be rectified. So rectified or registration, it's a mathematical tool to reshape the image to eliminate distortion and apply geographic coordinates to the file. So all of these methods are based on statistical operations uh, fundamentally. Um, so we call this ground control point rectification. We're going to look at the image, we're going to find features that we can readily identify and we're going to um, find those same points in either uh, an existing rectified image or potentially out in the field. Um, and we're gonna relate the, the image coordinates, so a row column number with the, the latitude longitude or uh, UTM XY coordinate, okay? And we're going to relate those two using various functions, usually a polynomial function, um, you know, so like a plus bx or, you know, y equals a plus bx or y equals a plus bx c x squared, etc. And then we'll calculate an error known as a, uh, or quantified as a root mean square that shows you the differences between the output location is the calculated co location for a GCP and the real coordinates for the same point. Because as you fit those equations, they're not going to be perfect um, in general. And so you will calculate um, a location for each pixel and you can relate that to where you have real GCPs and look at the difference summarize it using that remote, remote, bleh, that root mean square um, so that you know how much error you have, how far off you are in your registration. So the effects or the purposes of geometric correction, remove any geometric distortions, assign a map projection to the image, that's the georeferencing. Uh, and then this allows you to, for instance, mosaic uh, adjacent images and register images to be used for change detection. Um, so obviously, if you want to uh, know how an area has changed, you better have two images that line up very well. And in fact, there's been work on 
just how much error is introduced by um, uh, differences in, in registration between two images being compared. Um, sources of geometric errors. So there are platform related errors. Um, so for uh, airborne systems, um, there could be a change in the altitude, right? You might have some uh, turbulence. The, the attitude, so you know, you might have what we call yaw. Um, so the, the plane may point in a different azimuth. Um, uh, velocity, so you might speed up or slow down. And then you might have um, um, either roll or pitch, you know, and you've probably felt this on planes. Um, they're just roll, yaw, and pitch are just um, changes in the, the pointing of the, the platform um, as a, in three dimensions. A lot of that can be compensated for now, but you still see times where you see these effects. And then you have terrain related errors. Well, we've spoken about um, the effect of displacement, right? Um, and I said, well, from satellites, it's not usually, uh, it's, it's much less of a problem, I should say than it is with aerial photography. And that is true. However, um, you have places where you have, you know, massive changes in elevation over small areas, places like Colorado. And so um, when you have that kind of large difference in, um, in elevation, um, even satellite imagery will give you errors due to displacement. So we've talked about platform related errors, changes in altitude, attitude, velocity, and terrain related errors. We're gonna ignore the rest of these things, but you know, it happens. Um, sensors sometimes um, have fundamental errors um, that are related to the technology being used. Um, you know, uh, you can have effects due to earth rotation while you're taking the images. But we're going to try to take most of these out using ground control points. So ground control points are, are locations that can be both easily identified on the image and located um, in the field for acquisition of, of accurate positions. Or as I said, on, on ortho um, or planimetrically correct maps uh, or images, I should say, as well. So this has become very easy. When I started in remote sensing, in order to do this, you take out um, a USGS seven and a half minute um, uh, image, uh, I'm sorry, uh, topographic sheet, and you'd have to like tape it down to a digitizing board that was, you know, like a an architect's drawing desk, and you'd have to go and manually digitize, you know, street intersections and that sort of thing, and then relate them to the image. Now you can just put up two windows, left, right, left, unrectified image, right, rectified image, and just click back and forth be between them. For your GCPs, you need to have locations that can be most identified in the image and in the field or on maps or images to get accurate positions. So useful GCPs, usually things like uh, road intersections, uh, fence corners, landmarks, uh, rock formations, basically things you can see clearly and that don't move. So for instance, you know, here I have in the middle, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, bend in a road um, um, or a bend in a river. That's less useful than the road intersection to the left because um, that's going to change over time. It's going to change as the river potentially meanders. Um, so it would be better if you had like, a, um, um, you know, something like, um, uh, some, uh, uh, a river that has cut down into its 
its geology so that it's it stopped moving. Um, but if you have some uh, area that's you know flat and mostly sediments, then you're going to have meandering. So that's not going to remain the same over time. So considerations um, for the collection of ground control points, um, spatial distributions. Okay, we're going to relate these points in the image to the points in some reference. And if you're not collecting points over the entire image, then um, the equations that are fit are not going to um, are not going to take into account all of, for instance, the differences in, in topographic conditions over the image. Um, you want to catch that range of elevations. Um, you want to get points near the edges because if you don't, just mathematically, um, it it um, it decreases the accuracy of the fit. And what you wind up is with images that are nicely fit in the middle, and then you know the the outer edges just kind of go off in all sorts of directions because that's the 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 algorithm that was used to relate the GCPs didn't have any information there. And so it just fit it any way it wanted to. Um, and in general, the registration process is going to involve iterative evaluation of remote, remote excuse me, root mean square error. Okay. So you're going to put down a whole bunch of uh, GCP points and you're going to look at the error involved and it will, um, it'll either be good or bad. We'll talk about what good and bad remotes uh, root mean square error is. Um, and then you're going to look at the, the GCPs that are wrong, that have high errors and figure out the problem. And, you know, generally it's, it's something like, oh, I thought this was the road intersection that we were looking at, but it's actually the next one over, that sort of thing. And there I'm showing, this is from Erdos. Uh, imagine it's another remote, uh, an image processing system, but, but it's the same in ArcGIS and in Envy. You know, you'll have all your points in a table. You'll have the, the X and Y coordinate that you uh, digitized on the image, and then the X and Y coordinate that you have in your reference material. Again, either an image or a uh, topographic map, etc. Uh, and then for each pixel, you can calculate the error. And so that allows you to go through and say, okay, well, here's one pixel that's clearly way off. And then you investigate and figure out what went wrong and correct it. So I've talked about RMSE, okay? The RMSE is just the distance between the input location of a GCP and that is your source location and the estimated location for the same GCP. So what we've done is we have fit some functions that relate your file coordinates to your um, real world coordinate. You've made a prediction of where a particular GCP is in the, in the image. And again, um, those predictions are not going to be perfect. So what we do is we look at the difference between the, the output coordinate that's been calculated for a GCP and the actual coordinate for the same point after that point has been transformed, okay? And then RMS error is just um, total RMS error is expressed as a, a distance in the source coordinate system. So, you know, you've got rows and columns in the, the target image, the image that you're trying to process but what you want to do is convert it to the units that are in the source material. So um, X and Y in meters, for instance. Um, you can also um, um, calculate those in terms of pixel widths. So error in the output image. And so the error is just going to be a Euclidean distance. 
square root of the original um, value minus the estimated value squared uh, for both x and y, their sum, square root. Um, square root, uh, it is what it says it is. It's the root, square root, mean standard error, okay? Where the standard error is just that x error squared plus y error squared, okay? And so that error is the distance between the actual GCP location and their estimated location. And you could think of this as a circle around each GCP showing you where it's likely the actual pixel is um, on the, or, or the actual location is on the image or um, in the, um, the real world, depending on how you, you want to calculate it. In general, you would like to have um, a root mean square error that is in total um, um, in total the less than one pixel uh, in order to be doing a good job uh, that's that's what we would consider to be a good result now for some applications like change detection it's been shown that in fact half a pixel is a better um, target because um, you've, you're looking at two images and each one has some error and you're essentially you know, adding the error together when you're comparing the two images. So how do we actually do the, the geometric correction? Well, um, this is, is done by resampling the image. So Two-step process, we're gonna generate equations that relate image coordinates to geographic coordinates. And we're going to interpolate pixel values onto a new uh, image or matrix. And this is called resampling, okay? So you start off with something on the left and you know those long blue lines represent where the actual coordinates are in the real world, um, um, but they're, they're, um, you know, they're distorted within the image because of things like elevation effects and pointing effects. And then what you want to do is do some kind of transformation so that the image comes out the way it's supposed to be. So we've got some raw image and it's rotated in some way. And what we want is a function that will take the raw image and give you um, the geometrically corrected image. Um, what I show there is the colors kind of changing subtly. And the reason I, I display it that way is to let you know that, as we'll see, when you do this, it's not a one, it's generally not a one-to-one. -one. Um, you take one pixel and assign it a new location. Um, for reasons we'll discuss, very often you're averaging uh, a local area of pixels to get your new image. So there on the bottom, I'm showing you, you know, just an idea of what relationships could be between um, uh, observed locations in the real world and uh, lo uh, ob observations uh, in terms of file coordinates. So on the upper left-hand side, you can have those observations. On the um, upper right-hand side there, we have a linear equation. Like I said, y equals b plus ax or a plus bx, doesn't really matter. Um, and you can see that's a linear fit. Um, so, you know, there's a, a single line that describes um, the, the estimated relationship. That's clearly wrong in that case. So we might go down to the lower left. We might have a a second order polynomial, a quadratic equation, and that might do a better job. You know, it's gonna give you sort of a parabolic shape, uh, which is not going to fit the observations very well. But as we increase to a cubic relationship, then, um, so that's a third order polynomial, you're getting a better fit. 
So why do we use various different orders of fits? Um, so again, the order of transformation is just the order of the polynomial or the value of the polynomial used in the transformation. Usually we use first order or second order uh, transformations, okay? So if you look on the right, what kind of changes can we make using a first order and a second order um, or higher um, uh, uh, polynomial? First order, you know, you start with that up, uh, original image. You can change the scale in X, so you can kind of compress it or stretch it. You can change the scale in Y. You can change the skew in X uh, or the skew in Y. Um, or you can even rotate images using a first order um, polynomial. And in general, you're going to see multiple multiples of these. You're going to have like some change of scale and some rotation or some rotation and some skew. So second and higher order um, functions just allow you more um, flexibility with the relationship between input and output. So you start with an original image and you can sort of, um, you know, uh, do some rotation and uh, maybe some, some nonlinear skewing. So you can see those, those lines kind of bend and you can get very um, flexible relationships. Sorry, telephone call. Um, you can get very flexible relationships um, between the input and output coordinates, which is great, except that those higher order rectifications um, um, can give you less regular and predictable results. So you can have an image, particularly here we're going back to making sure you get points on the edges. Um, you can get um, relationships where you've you very closely matched the GCP points that you have, but where you don't have GCP points, you know, virtually anything can happen because the, the math is complex enough. So um, you could then get very high distortion in the image and that's not what you want to get. In general, you want a first order um, equation, possibly a second order code for um, satellite images, which tend to have more re regular relationships. And I generally have gone to second and sometimes third order relationships when you have photos that are gonna have more displacement in them, for instance. So, okay, now we know where each individual pixel from the, the input image is supposed to go in the output image. So. How do we um, how do we select which pixels are going to be um, are going to be moved into uh, are going to be used to calculate the output pixels? Okay, there's a number of ways we can do this. Okay, so on the left, upper left, you can see in this image the just the input image, and and you've got four you know imaginary GCPs in there. Um, and then in the upper right, you've got the output grid where, and, and we've shown where those GCPs are shown. Then you imagine the lower left, we've sort of rotated that image and, you know, moved it in the X, Y. And what we see in that image is that in general, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between where the input pixels fall on the output pixels. You can very easily have overlap of one input pixel into multiple output pixels. And so that might be okay for your purposes, but it leads to certain problems as we'll see. So on the lower right, you need some kind of rule or resampling method um, to assign input pixels to the output grid. So different approaches, um, nearest neighbor, it uses the value of the closest pixel to assign the output pixel value. So you're gonna look at the input value or the input pixel values, you know, the input 
pixel coordinates and the output grid and you're going to calculate where the nearest pixel center is and whatever pixel has the closest pixel center um, uh, that's what you're going to assign to it sounds simple right i mean why would you do anything else well we'll see um, bilinear interpolation so it actually uses uh, the data um, values of four pixels a two by two window that surround each of the output pixels um, to calculate an output value um, cubic convolution uses the data values of 16 pixels so a four by four window to calculate an output value with a, a cubic function and uh, by cubic spline interpolation you see as an option sometimes uh, it fits a function through the the points and uses that to figure out what the output values are supposed to be cubic spline is like a um it's like a, a very um flexible way of fitting points um fitting a function to points um without having to worry about the problems of higher order polynomials so what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches? Well, I'm going to start on the right with nearest neighbor resampling. So nearest neighbor resampling is going to transfer individual data values, individual pixel level data values without averaging as the other methods do. Okay. So um, you don't, um, you don't throw out any extreme values, which you would if you were averaging. Um, and you're never mixing together different pixels of different things. So you can imagine, for instance, if we're moving um, a pixel that's um, in a forest, but at, adjacent to a road. So the next pixel over is a road. Well, using one of the bilinear or the cubic convolution resampling, um, you're going to wind up averaging those pixels together. Okay. And what's the average of a road and a forest? I mean, what is the average of a, well, it depends on what kind of system you're in. If you were in a, you know, in a coniferous forest in the Pacific Northwest, it would be an old growth looking pixel in general. So um, if you're looking to discriminate um, between vegetation types or locating an edge um, or depending, uh, you know, if you're looking at levels of turbidity in a lake um, that maybe has different um, elevations or depths, then averaging pixels together may, may be, may be uh, a mistake, okay? However, disadvantage, when the method is used to resample, okay, from a um, from a larger to a smaller grid size, um, or really from um, um, more or less equal uh, grid sizes, there's usually this jagged effect, okay, a stair stepped effect along um, diagonal lines and curves, okay. You get this jagged effect, um, which is uh, maybe fine for say land use classification but aesthetically is not pleasing and that might be important for other purposes um because you're not mixing pixels um uh, nearest neighbor is suitable for use before classification um however you know as you go through the calculation um in depth what you see is that sometimes um individual input pixels are lost um, that is they are not the closest pixel to any output pixel um, and so you're going to lose data uh, contrary um, you can have cases where one input pixel is actually the closest pixel to two output pixels and therefore will be copied into both of them and so you might lose data you might duplicate data. You know, this is in theory, at least a, a problem. Um, it's the easiest of the three methods to compute. It's the fastest to use. 
True, but everything's so fast now. Computers are so fast now. Probably not unless you're dealing with massive amounts of data. Not a problem. Um, if you're using them on uh, it on uh, linear thematic data or things that you want to interpret um, uh, um, and get out linear features, so roads or streams, um, the jaggedness can result in breaks or gaps in networks, right? Because you might have a stream that suddenly, you know, moves one pixel to the south as you're doing the resampling. And so it's not going to match the same way it did in the original image. Um, nearest neighbor resampling is appropriate for thematic uh, files, i.e. GIS coverages, um, because you never want to do averaging on a thematic file. That is, you never want to take um, something where class five is, um, you know, uh, uh, forest, six is grassland, and seven is water. And you don't want to take forest five and average it with water seven to get a grassland. That doesn't make any sense. So we're going to move from the right to the left. Um, um, so bilinear interpolation resampling, it results in output images that are smooth or smoother without that stair step or jagged effect that you get from nearest neighbor. Um, however, since the pixels are averaged, um, you're going to have, you essentially smooth the images, edges are smooth. Some extremes of the data values are going to be lost and those might be important. Um, the, the image will be more spatially accurate than nearest neighbors. That is, you know, individual features are, are going to look like they're closer to where they should be. Um, and it's often used when you're changing the cell size of the data. So um, if you're looking at spot, it would be like 10 meters versus TM um, at 30 meters, it's probably okay to use some, it's going to be okay to, to do some averaging as you're going because you've got a different pixel size. Cubic convolution takes this one more step. It uses a four by four resampling, so it's averaging 16 pixels together. Um, in most cases, the mean and standard deviation of those output pixels are going to match the input pixels more closely than um, the other sampling methods. Um, it doesn't do a straight average of the four by four pixels. It does a weighted average. So pixels toward the middle are more heavily weighted in the output. Um, so depending on the image itself, it can either have, um, uh, um, it can either sharpen the image or smooth out noise. Um, it just depends on what data values are being processed at that time. And this method is, is recommended when you're dramatically changing the cell size of the data. So if you're looking at, you know, TM at 30 meters and a photo that's at two meters, then having that smoothing makes a lot of sense, okay? The disadvantages, um, the data values may be altered, right? As we've discussed before, and the method is slow, but again, computers are fast and always getting faster. So unless you have enormous images that need to be processed, it's not a, a big problem. Ortho rectification is a form of rectification that corrects for terrain displacement. Okay, so it's, it's directly using a digital elevation model of the study area and using that to fit um, to fit the image using those GCPs, but bringing in both X and Y coordinates as well as Z coordinates. Okay. Um, in flat areas, ortho rectification is generally not necessary, but in mountainous areas or if you have buildings where there's a um, um, where you have lots of variation. Um, in cases when you need a high degree of accuracy, author rectification is often amended, uh, especially for 
airborne imagery because of course we see more displacement. Um, to perform the orthorectification, you need to have a custom geometric correction model for a specific mission or camera. Um, and then um, you need a camera model, okay? And the, the camera model basically tells you where, um, and here we go back to fiducial marks. Um, it tells you where the, um, the photo was um, or the image was inside the camera, okay? So it can be related directly to the, the focal length and um, where the focal, uh, where the principal point is in the center of the lens. You need to know basically the way that the camera was pointed and where the, um, the photo was inside the camera. It's also possible to purchase image data that's already georeferenced. So um, very often these images are rectified to a particular map projection and pixel size and have had all the radiometric corrections applied. This is the, the common state of satellite of publicly owned satellite images today. So in general, what people download if they're downloading Landsat is um, an image that has been both geometrically and radiometrically corrected, um, which is tremendously uh, advantageous relative to doing it yourself. Um, but sometimes you don't want rectified data. Um, every time you rectify an image, you're degrading the image spectrally or spatially or both ways. So if you're doing multiple, if you have cases where you need to um, compare images that have different projections, then you're gonna have to resample one of those images to the new projection. And that's gonna cause a, a second degrading of the image data. Um, and so you don't want to re-rectify only if they have to, unless you have to conform to a different projection system or it has to be uh, registered to other rectified data. I should, I should go back and say, so public data, you're going to get a, um, you're probably going to get a, a registered, geometrically registered product with radiometric corrections. However, as I mentioned before, with private data, they charge you for that additional processing and it's it's not cheap it's you know it can be a substantial fraction of the cost of the imagery itself so um then you have to make decisions based on budget uh, and time um, for whether or not you're going to do that geo-referencing yourself um or pay the additional money <laughs>